But we're going to try something this morning. Um, it's been a few months since I've done a children's sermon. So I don't know how many to call up, but probably the young ones up to six, seven, maybe. Uh, we're going to try and do something peculiar this morning. So, so if you want to come up here, I'm going to sit here. If you want to come sit down here. And I'd like a few adults, too, because there's a little bit of help I will need during this illustration. Yeah, you can sit right there. Yeah, look at you. You're courageous. Sit right by the pastor. Because pastors can be very scary. <laughs> ask, ask my wife. She would, she would say, what a crew. Don't you just love them? Man, that's what I really appreciate about this body of believers. Children, there's obvious they are important. <clears throat> so, I'm going to read, unless someone would read. Who can read? Anybody up here, can you read? Yes. You can read? <coughs> no. Okay. How old are you? Yes. He's six, so he's going to read for us a, ber a verse from the Apostle Paul of Ephesians, and it's the New Living Translation. Could you read that, Noah? Right. right there. God God saved you by his grace when you believed in you. Can't you create um, credit? Credit for you, you can't his, take credit. You can't take credit for his. It is a gift from God. His salvation is not a reward for, for the good things we have done. So not no so known. Um, none of us. None of us can boast about it. Very good, thank you. Let's give my hand. Well, that little verse tells us something from the Apostle Paul about the salvation that is offered to people like you and me, including children. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you and I can't take credit for it. It is a gift. So I have something for a few of you, not all of you yet, but maybe even when we're done with you. But I have some apples. And every apple has a different name. So I'm going to, maybe you take one and your dad can help you. Let's see. Over here, maybe the two of you can figure out. The, the names are very small, printed on them. Oh, you want to have one, of course. Okay. I'm going to grab that one here. Mike, maybe you should have one. One down here. I see that hand. Yep. One here. And one here. Now, do we have any botanists in the group? Nope. How many variety apples do you think there are in the USA? What would you guess? Variety of apples. How many different kinds of apples are there in the USA? You know it's about 2,500. Isn't that amazing? Now, Apples kind of look the same. Hold up your apple. They kind of look the same, don't they? Yeah, so let's see what kind of apples we have. What do you have over here? You have an apple. What variety is it? <coughs> Honeycrisp. Oh, we heard that. Okay, next one. What do you have? Pink lady. Who likes those? Okay. Who, what do you have, young man? What is it? I better read that. From New Zealand. Breeze. Yeah, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Next one. What do we have here, Mike? <laughs> Brayburn. Some of you like those. By the way, this illustration is leading to something, just so you know. Okay, what's, what's the next one? Yeah, that's a, that's a new one. I never. It's called Cheeky from New Zealand. Yeah. Okay, next one. Who else has one? Right here. What the? Red Delicious. Hold that one up. I know that's a really pop. Can you hold that one up? That's a popular one, isn't it? Next one. 
Honey crisp. One more. Oh, I bet. Right. So we got a green one. Yeah. So what's? We got a Shailin. Shailin. You want to hold it up? Yeah, hold that one up. Okay. So you all have an apple, but they all look the same, don't they? Don't they look alike? Hold your apple up. You know, there's 2,500 different kinds of apples in the USA. In the world, there's 7,500 different kinds of apples. But they all kind of look the same, don't they? But what am I telling you by this? Because I have another apple, right? That's quite an apple, isn't it? Is that an apple? No! What is it? Broccoli. Broccoli and what else? Vegetables. Vegetables. Very good. What else do we have in there? All your favorites. Cauliflower. Cauliflower. Very good. Now, is this the same as your apple? No. No. It's totally different, isn't it? Now, you can discuss this with your parents when you get home. But your apples represent all the religions of the world. All the ethics of the world. All the religious thought of the world. All the ideas about God in the world. And they are all over the U.S. Do you know that there are like 350 religions just in the U.S.? And across the world, there are over 4,000 religions across the world. But here's what I'm telling you. We read the verse, right? I'm going to read the verse again. God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. You know what all religions of the world have in common? Anybody want to take a guess, or a mom or dad? You have to work to get saved. Did you know that? There's not one exception. You have to work sometimes. It's a lot of work, sometimes a little work. Even some mainline churches believe that you must work. All religions of the world have that in common. There's one that's different. It's what Jesus said. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden with what? Sin, and I will give you rest. And Paul said this. It's a gift from God. So here's the big idea this morning. All those apples represent religion. Even at your schools. You have to work to get to heaven. The Apostle Paul said Christianity is different. It's a, what is it? Starts with a G. It's a adult. It's a gift. What's a gift? Can you earn a gift? If you think you can earn a gift, what does it fail to be? It's not a gift anymore. You earned it. Yes. Like a privilege. Oh, helpful. But it's a gift. Now, you have an apple. Did anybody not get an apple? We'll make sure you get one. But I'm going to pray for you. We're going to pray because I know this morning is fall kickoff, right? And you're going to be learning about Jesus from the Bible, about God's plan, his purposes, and giving his son to save the likes of you and me. So we're going to pray that through this next school year into May, that you begin to see how great and glorious that gift is. So let's pray. Father, thank you. That there's a reminder all through scripture. Reminders that salvation is a gift. Jesus gave his life. He suffered, died, and was resurrected and ascended to the right hand of his father. And now is mediating his grace to his people, including children. Thank you for that gift. Thank you for each one. We pray as they study over the next months. These young children will grow in grace and truth. And they'll love those who they are friends with at school. And tell them about this free gift. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time. Amen. Okay, you can be seated. But if you didn't get an apple, I have another one for you to take. It's a Zestar, I guess. Who? Okay, yeah. Anybody not get an apple? Here we go. One... Now, you don't want one. <laughs> Do you want one? No, you might want to eat these later, not during the sermon. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Did I miss anybody? You bought one? Okay. One over. Okay. Oh, oh. I have two left. It took a little longer than I thought, so we'll shorten the sermon maybe a little bit. We have been in the book of, of Romans, Paul's grand and glorious message. And he's talking about what we call the doctrine of justification. And if you have that title slide, if you could bring that up, we're going to do a little bit of work on this. Luther said this. The doctrine of justification, we'll get to what that is in a minute. The doctrine of justification is that doctrine by which the church stands or falls. But I think there's a little bit of extension from that. The doctrine of understanding God acquitting and pardoning people in Christ Jesus is essential for us so we don't stumble. In other words, I think it needs to become a part of our mindset that we are justified. Go one more if you would. The ultimate pardon. We're on part two. So I'd like you to just go ahead a little bit to the gospel slide. And I keep bringing this up because a story uh, I've told a number of times. But as a young man, I went to church. I figured up the number of times I ended up in a church building. It's about 1,200 times. That's a lot, isn't it? I don't ever remember hearing the gospel. If you're here this morning... You've never heard the gospel. Here it is. The message that God has acted in history by the sacrificial death and resurrection of his son, Jesus the Messiah, providing a substitute and an avenue, faith and repentance, by which humans can be rescued from the penalty of eternal punishment and recreated to become a people who display delight, treasure, and rejoice in their new life and his glory and greatness, both here and forevermore. So we've been looking at, and we'll just jump ahead to justification slide. We're going to be reminded. I think it's one more. Maybe one more. Sorry. Our sins are forgiven. They're transferred to Christ. Keep going. And we'll do this. One more. One more. Justification. There it is. Now we'll get into the message. It's an instantaneous, when a person believes, act of which God, in which he thinks of us and treats us as forgiven, and Christ's righteousness is belonging to us, and declares us to be righteous in his sight. So we're looking at six characteristics from Romans 5. So I am going to have you just stay seated. I'm going to read Romans 5, a portion, and then we'll jump into it. I'll begin with verse 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps... For a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Would you pray with me? Father and God, we come as beggars. The natural man does not accept the things of God. They are foolishness to him. But the man and the woman of God and the child of God sees them as a treasure, as gold nuggets to be mined and have us, Lord, be of that mindset this morning. We see these great nuggets and we bow down before you and we give you thanks. Would you just illuminate our minds? You get the credit by your spirit, the great teacher, to help us apply them as we learn them. And may they change us 
May they awaken us. May they give us rigor in our Christian life, wanting more. And blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So I ask that for myself, to hunger and thirst for more. To see what you've given me and this, these here with me, the great treasure of Jesus. May we love you more because we've been here. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have six declarations. By the way, this is just filled. I, we're just touching the surface. Apostle Paul writes the book of Romans, probably, and I think it is, necessary for every Christian to read through the book of Romans once a year, if you, even a portions of it. I think it's, it's very good to memorize Romans, a number of verses out of Romans, because it's so key in understanding the Christian life. So the first declaration comes right out from chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why does Paul have to write that? Because of their estrangement. He's assuming they know from 1, 2, 3, 4 chapters, first four chapters of Romans, that there's something between the unbeliever and God. And it's called sin. There's a chasm. And Paul says we have peace with God. The enmity is gone. If you can imagine Adam and Eve in the garden. What do you think they were, that was like? They are federal heads. They fell into sin. What they were doing, I think, is enjoying the presence of God. They're, they probably fled to him. And then we get Romans, I mean, Genesis 3, and they're fleeing from him. And Paul is saying that enmity, that strife, that distance, that chasm, if you're a believer, if we are believers, has now been taken away and we have peace. The Old Testament idea of peace is much richer than what we use, of course, in the English culture. Had the idea of shalom, well-being, rest, fully assured. And Paul's using that here. He's got a Hebrew background. He's saying, we have shalom with God. They use it over yet still in Israel. Greeting one another, they say, peace or shalom. So we looked at that. Number two, it says, we're rooted in grace. He says this, through him we have obtained access. That's big, access by faith into this grace. What is great grace? God acting for his purposes in your life, my life, and in the world. And Paul is saying, we are now given grace. By the way, you can't exhaust grace. People go looking for something more, something deeper, something greater. And the apostle Paul says, you are rooted in grace. It is unlimited what you can know and experience in the greatness of God. Paul says, we're now rooted in it. We stand in it. We can stand in it and endure the worst of the worst. Number three, he goes on to say, we have obtained faith into the grace which we stand and we rejoice in the hope. There's a third one. Confident expectation. We have hope. The Apostle Paul said people in the world, world are without God and without hope. He infers, of course, that we have hope. Why do we have hope? Because we're justified. What he started, he'll bring to completion. That's what hope is. And he's confident because God has saved him, the Apostle Paul. He's saying that which he has done, he will bring to completion. But what's hope? A construal of the future. I listened to a sermon on the way here this morning. Most of us, do you know this? Are expert at worry. We're expert and fear. In fact, I didn't know this till this morning. Do you know what men fear the most? The whole idea that I'm going to run out of money. Then I learned from study statistics that these men, when they get together, they talk about football and the weather and their, maybe a little bit about their wives, about their children, but they never talk about money which they're worrying about all the time. The Apostle Paul, I think, is helping us to see we don't have to be a people of worry. We can be confident that the one that's gone before us will hold us. 
Robert T. Robbins wrote a book on hope. And he said, without hope, we all shrivel and die. And we know people are hopeless. And people are helpless. And Paul says, we have hope. It's a construal of the future. I want you to dig deep. How do you construe the future? I am guilty. I think I probably could be a worry wart if there is such a thing. I could be a wart that could be here all the time. I could worry all the time. But Paul is saying for us, you and I, our minds are to construe the future as hopeful. Does that hit anybody across the back of the head saying, Pastor Ron, you need to think differently than what you're thinking. You can strew the future in all these what if. And Paul says, we have hope. But it's not just here. It's an eternal hope. In fact, it's so great and glorious, he says, verse 3, that we can rejoice in our sufferings. What's that got to do with hope? A lot. The word suffering or tribulation is likely the word pressure. Oh, we feel that. Pressure of living in a world that's hostile to God. Its systems would stand in opposition to God. You can't even read about God in the paper anymore. I remember looking at some old papers. We tore down our granary on the farm once. A long time ago. We tore down the granary. And you know it was in the walls, right? There were whiskey bottles. That's another story. But there was papers old newspapers, they had articles about the living God. Today, you can't find it. And we live in that kind of world that not only doesn't really like to talk about God, they suppress God. They suppress the truth. And the Apostle Paul says, listen, we not only have hope when things are going well, but even in our suffering, I don't want to take credit for this. We rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance character, character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. What's he saying? I'll give John Piper credit for this. Every nanosecond, every nanosecond, if you jump ahead a little bit to 817, I'm headed someplace with this. And if you are children, then you are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. I'm going to read it again because you might have missed it and read it fast. And if children, then you are heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Like that's a part of the life, right? Because if you live in a world that's opposed to Christ and the Holy Spirit's work in you, that's a kind of suffering. I'm, I'm headed for this uh, meaning to this. Yeah, provided we suffer with him or that we may be also glorified with him. Back to Romans 5. What that means, every nanosecond of your suffering, in the path of obedience, and that's very important you understand that. In the path of obedience, the Apostle Paul is saying will work for glory. Let me say it again. Every nanosecond, every kind of suffering, slander, malice, you name it, physical suffering, every nanosecond of that, the Apostle Paul is saying counts for a glory. Now, I can't measure it. Sometimes I'll look back at suffering and go, I'm glad that's over, but it changed me. It didn't make me bitter. It made me better. And the Apostle Paul is saying those sufferings in the path of obedience, walking in obedience, works glory. Moms and dads, when your children come home from school and say, and my grandson went through months and months and months of bullying. And he would come home and try and walk through this. And his dad would... Walk him through it. And I try and walk him through it. And I wish it would have been equipped with this at that time to say, Peyton, God will use that for his glory. Don't grow bitter. There's a good side to the end of that. You got a few good friends and the bullying stopped and the teacher came, stepped up and said no more. But for us, the Apostle Paul said, that hope is so sure 
that what has been provided in Jesus, the hope, the anchor of your soul, will work glory even in the midst of suffering. Because we're suffering. The people say, well, I, 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 not like such and such a missionary. I know that. You know that. They have suffered things that, and there's people suffering right now across the world. But there's a kind of suffering, isn't there? I want to just bring out one. It's actually mentioned by Peter in regard to Lot in 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. I, I just came up with this. I was studying. This came t- to my mind as Peter's talking about Lot's suffering. And Lot, who God rescued, he says, was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. And it goes on to say he was tormented in his soul. Wow. That's the kind of pressure we live with day to day. He was greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked. It's all around us. That's a kind of suffering. Number five, we are sure that we'll be saved through Christ. We will be saved. This is a hope that we have. Validated by what? The Holy Spirit's presence. Having believed, heard, 113 Ephesians, having heard and believed, next point, you were sealed. It's a down payment, the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul says that Holy Spirit is the love of God shed abroad, poured lavishly into our lives. My friend calls the Holy Spirit the love of God in us to love God back. He gets all the credit. The very heartfelt presence of God in us. Amazing. The consequence of justification, being assured, being declared righteous, that what he's begun, he will carry to completion. Six consequence. This one's a tough one. Rejoicing. Verse 10. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of the Son. How much more we are reconciled. Now we shall be saved by his life. More than that, we rejoice. I don't always rejoice. I bet you don't either. Oh, I'm not supposed to be betting. I'm, I'm just saying you probably don't rejoice all the way. As you ought as well. But the Apostle Paul is making a case here. It's, I think he's like in, in the courtroom. Making a case for justification. And he says, by the way. All this tribulation. This suffering. This being justified by faith. Having peace. When the day is done. There's to be joy. Years ago. I knew a man. The older he became. He was a Christian, I believe. No more grumpy he became. <laughs> I remember one time when my kids said, Dad, you've been a Christian a long time. How can we keep, keep getting grumpier every year? I said, you know, you're right. But the Apostle Paul is saying, we are, notice the word, rejoy, rejoice. We are to re-up joy. How does that happen? I think the means of grace, the word of God, the people of God, the worship of God, the prayer to God, all those means of grace need to be cultivated. The story is told in statistics, Gallup polls, others, Barna Group, the average pastor is praying about 10 minutes a day. Guilty. I fit that. But it's worse for the people in the pew. They're like three minutes a day. Bible reading. Most Christians in America are down to three to two, sometimes less a day because it's about 15 minutes a week. We re-up our joy by getting back into the book of joy. It reminds us we are fallen. We are broken. 
And people don't like to hear that, but we are broken. And what does Psalm 23 say? He restores my soul. Okay, three quick applications. Number one, how should I think? A number of things. Don't walk through life thinking that your and my good works finally nailed down God accepting me. He finally accepted me. I shared Christ with my neighbor. God accepts me. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to share Christ. You need to pray for us. You need to share Christ. But don't think that some work you do somehow gets God to like you, accept you, It's a game changer. He's our substitute. He must be accepted as our substitute. And his work, the book of Hebrews says, is sufficient and fully finished. Instead, we should walk through life knowing that we are justified. God has acted in his sovereign will. And he sustains our justification. The Roman Catholic doctrine of justification says you have to maintain it. That you're justified, God declares you righteous, but you maintain it by your good works. That's not the Protestant idea. That wasn't Luther's idea. That wasn't John Owens, Jonathan Edwards, and all the early church fathers, many of them anyway, that God sustains our justification. Number two, how should I feel? How does God look at our sin? This is helpful from John Owen. Here's what he said. God, he says, does not condemn the sinner when they sin, but he still condemns the sin. So the conscience awakens us that we've sinned. The Holy Spirit says, do something about it. What? confession and repentance but when we sin we need to be careful that we don't think God's condemning us the sinner but he's rather condemning the sin that we've just carried out number three what should I do a couple things be careful who you take your cues from If you've lived in a shame-based church, shame-based family, you have to be careful that those old tapes don't keep playing. Well, if you, or if I, we take cues from God. I recognize something that it's, I don't know if anybody has you, one of your children tell you something and you go, I, I'm not sure what they mean by that. And a couple of years later, you go, oh, that's what they meant by that. So I was with my son a number of years ago and he said, Dad, you always do that. I'm driving the car. You always do that. I said, what do I do? He said, well, you get to the red light and then you keep moving forward. You keep inch, inching forward. He said, it bugs me and you're going to wear out your brakes. So this happened two weeks ago. True story. I'm at the red light. There's two, three cars in front of me, and I'm inching forward, and I'm going, I know why I do it. I take my cues from the car in front of me. They move, I move. I'm not taking my cues from the light. I'm taking my cues from those people around me. But that's really a Christian story, isn't it? Because some of us do that. We take cues from our history and say, oh, yeah, I remember that now. That's why... And they began, we began to play that old tape. And the Apostle Paul, I think, would have us to take cues from the truth. We all have heart habits. Just because they're a heart habit doesn't mean they're a good habit. We need to change them. And I think I'll just end with this. We, I think we, you and I, we're all in the same boat here. We need to start preaching truth to ourselves. The culture's not going to do it. That's why when we get together, we shouldn't be just talking about the Vikings, Packers, sorry, or such and such. We need to talk about truth. Like, how are you doing? Can I pray for you? That's a great one to do. And then here's what I always tell my elders, told my elders back in the church I came from. 
the minute somebody tells you a prayer request, can we pray right now? It doesn't have to be a sentence or five sentences. I mean, it could be a sentence prayer saying, Lord, would you help so-and-so through this? I stand with him or her. Amen. But to, I think there's something we can do at a very practical level is preach the truth to ourselves. So when you memorize a verse, rehearse it through the week. Pray it. Feel it. Take it. Let it go deep with you. And myself included. I'm going to have the worship team come up and we're going to pray. Some of this text into our hearts this morning. Our Father and our God, you are good and glorious and gracious. You've delivered us from the wrath to come. You've set our feet upon a rock. We now stand having access to you, the King of glory. And we stand in these truths this morning. You've declared us acquitted, pardoned in Christ Jesus through faith and repentance. So Father, this morning, I bring to bear again the good news. If there's someone here who's not sure if today was their last day, Day that they would be with you in paradise. Would you draw them? Would you use this text? Would you use the text we use with the children? For by grace you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's a gift. So that no human could ever boast before you. Would you draw that one this morning? It could be a child. Who heard the gospel a dozen times but never believed. May this be a morning. An afternoon when they say, Mom, I didn't understand that. Dad, I didn't understand that. How do you become a Christ follower? Draw that one. Lord, today as we sing in closing, would you honor your name through music? In Jesus' name, amen.